Okay, I see some early birds today. Just wanted to welcome everybody to today's program. We'll start here in about nine minutes. Um, in the meantime, you'll see something up on your screen. Uh, we have a lot of things to mention before the program today, so I'll be speaking up from time to time. Uh, it's a good opportunity to adjust your volume, make sure you're comfortable, ask us any questions, and let us know where you're logging in from today. Um, we should have a lot of questions today. Um, just a reminder, today's program will be a screening of a short uh, film video for about 24 minutes, and then we'll have uh, open panel discussion with our panelists today. So please do think about your questions early. Uh, we always like to remind people that you use the Q&A box for your questions. In the Q&A box, there's an option to upvote and comment. So we encourage you to do that. So if you want to upvote a comment you or upvote a question, you can always click the thumbs up symbol next to the question that you see in the Q&A box. And that's more likely, uh, it means it's more likely to be asked uh, before the end of the program. So we encourage you to do that as well. Um, look forward to seeing you today and we will start here in about eight minutes. Okay, uh, this is John Haber again. I just wanted to mention to those of you who are on social media, if you're on Facebook, YouTube, Twitch, or LinkedIn, um, I will be watching the comments for questions. So if you have your own questions, don't hesitate to ask. I'll try to catch those, but we do recommend, especially if you're on social media, ask those questions early, even before the Q&A session. Um, that'll give us plenty of time to uh, make note of those questions and sort of make sure that they're presented to our panelists today. We have an hour total today. Uh, we'll start at 12 noon. Uh, we'll have a short screening for about 24 minutes of the video, and then we'll follow that with a panel discussion. So we look forward to seeing you, and we'll start here in about five minutes.
Okay, uh, great. Just as a reminder, we do have closed captioning today. Um, you can find closed captioning by clicking on the bottom of your screen next to the live transcript button or the CC symbol to show your subtitle. You could also hide the subtitle that way. There is a method to uh, hiding chat windows if you'd like. Um, if you click next to your chat uh, icon, you can uh, show or hide chat previews. So we recommend you do that if the chats are disruptive, but otherwise we encourage you uh, to actively participate, including chat. Um, there will be about 160 people in the room today, so I'm sure there will be an active uh, discussion conversation. Uh, please let us know where you're logging in from today. We have people from all over the country who are interested in this topic today. Um, and we look forward to seeing everyone from across the country here today. So. Um, as I mentioned earlier, you're going to have to ask those questions early if you um, would like your ask uh, your questions to be addressed. We don't have uh, we don't have a lot of time today. We have at least 15 minutes about uh, to take those questions, but because of the number of people we have, uh, we may not be able to get to all of them. So the earlier you ask, the more likely uh, we will be able to address your questions. And we look forward to seeing you at the start of the program. We'll start here in about two minutes. Hey, I wanted to welcome everybody to today's program. Uh, my name is John Haber. I'm the Field Services Director for the California Preservation Foundation. And with us today, we have four panelists, as well as my colleague here, who is... Chris Madrid Fetch. Hi, everybody. I'm so excited. So yes, go ahead, John. You start off, and then I have some things I need to add, of course. Sure. Um, so today's program will be an hour in length. As usual, we recommend you ask those questions using the Q&A box. So click on the Q&A uh, button to access those questions. You also have the ability to, ability to upvote or uh, comment on questions if you want to see them addressed. So if you see questions from others, we encourage you to use that feature. Today's video will be about 25 minutes in length. Then we'll turn it over to an open panel discussion led by John Roosh. And then we will close uh, with questions from the audience. So we look forward to speaking with our panelists today. With that being said, I'm going to turn it back to Chris and um, we'll get going here in a minute. Yes, thank you, John. I just wanted to say hello to everybody and welcome to our program today. I had a preview of this video tour and you are going to love it. Uh, we had some discussion during our last program about using the chat window and also closed captioning. And John and I did our research and we have answers for you. So if you are using closed captioning and the chat window is bothering you, you can't see what the closed captioning says, you can actually hover over the, the closed caption at the bottom and then pull 
pull it to another part, portion of your screen, and then it won't be getting interrupted by the chat. We do encourage you to use that chat window the entire time that we're having the program so you can share your thoughts uh, with your friends and see where everybody's calling in from. If you find you don't want to use that chat window, there's a little tiny arrow at the bottom of your Zoom screen, and you can click on that, and it says, I think it says disable uh, instant messaging for chat, and it'll stop popping up. But for everybody else who enjoys it, I'm going to be in the chat and participating on the back end of this one. I'm going to leave it up to the two Johns to be in charge. So with that, I want to introduce John. You go ahead. Oh, which John? We're going to run into that problem on this webinar. No, you go ahead, John. I'm going to call the other one Haber. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, great. Uh, so my name is John Rush. Uh, I'm a Senior Historic Preservation Specialist at ICF, and I want to thank CPF. Uh, and thanks to everyone who has joined us today for Modern on Market Street, which is a film tour of the Market Street corridor followed by a panel discussion. Uh, chances are that anyone who has lived in or visited the San Francisco Bay Area basically since the mid-19th century has experienced Market Street in one way or another. Uh, it's almost impossible to spend time in San Francisco without being under, on top of, or in the near vicinity of the street, which is the city's primary commercial spine in its uh, symbolic heart. Although Market Street is heavily trafficked, um, relatively few are familiar with the history of its modernist design, which was developed by three um, master post-war designers, Lawrence Halperin, Mario Ciampi, and John Carl, John Carl Warnicke. Uh, their work for the Market Street Redevelopment Plan in the 1960s and 1970s reimagined San Francisco's primary uh, traffic artery, but in ways that are quite taken for granted today. So this film was created in partnership with San Francisco Public Works. I also wanna specifically recognize my ICF colleague, Kainoa Little, who was responsible for filming, collecting drone footage and editing. Um, so at this point, I'd like to introduce my fellow panelists. Gretchen Hilliard Boyce is the founder of Groundwork Planning and Preservation, a historic resources consulting firm that focuses on projects that improve communities, highlight undertold stories, and holistically evaluate historic places utilizing the, the cultural landscape approach. Since 2007, Gretchen has evaluated hundreds of historic resources for, for federal, state, and local agencies and has worked on some of the largest planning projects in California, including the redesign of the California State Capitol, San Francisco's Better Market Street Project, California High Speed Rail, India Basin Shoreline Park, and many local planning and private residential projects. Woody LeBounty is Vice President of Advocacy and Programs at San Francisco Heritage, a 50-year-old nonprofit with a mission to protect and enhance San Francisco's unique architectural and cultural identity. Before joining Heritage, Woody was the longtime executive director of the local history organization, Western Neighborhoods Project. There he led efforts to save relief cottages from the 1906 San Francisco earthquake, bring more than 50,000 historic images online, and use arts and history to equitably enrich neighborhoods. He does a lot of research and writing on San Francisco history, articles, context statements, and three books to date, and enjoys the challenges of project-based partnerships between diverse community groups, historians, and government agencies. And Hannah Simonson is an Associate Cultural Resources Planner at Page and Turnbull in San Francisco. In this role, she has researched, documented, and evaluated numerous modernist resources, including authoring the the Trans Bay Pyramid and Redwood Park Historic Resource Evaluation. She received a Master of Science in Historic Preservation at the University of Texas at Austin School of Architecture in 2017, where her thesis on modern Diamond, Diamond Heights was awarded the Outstanding Thesis in Historic Preservation. Her personal and professional research interests include modernism and late modernism, second and third Bay tradition regional architecture, San Francisco redevelopment and public art, and privately owned public open spaces. Hannah is, current, is the current board president of the Northern California chapter of Docomomo US. So with that, we can queue up the video and we will meet back here after it is done. See you then. Hi, my name is John Rush. I'm a senior architectural historian and historic preservation specialist at the consulting firm ICF. Welcome to our tour of Market Street. We hope you enjoy it. So we'll start the tour here 
at the intersection of Market Street and Stewart Street. Uh, this is the eastern terminus of Market Street, and we can have a good view of a couple of really distinctive features of the Market Street redevelopment plan design. Uh, these include the red brick paving, which extends all the way along the, the sidewalk of Market Street, as well as the granite curb here, which lines the street from here to Octavia Boulevard. The movement to redesign Market Street emerged in parallel with the effort to construct the San Francisco Bay Area Rapid Transit District, or BART, which was approved by voters in 1962. That same year, Market Street business people and property owners agreed upon a few different goals. To transform Market Street into one of the world's most attractive boulevards, to rid Market Street of its shabby atmosphere, and to put new life into Market Street as a center of Bay Area business, shopping, and entertainment. Their hope was to update the appearance and feeling of Market Street to appeal to the tastes of middle-class workers and shoppers, which meant replacing aging infrastructure and some of the quote-unquote unsavory people who used it. The group retained a team of consultants, which included local landscape architect Lawrence Halprin, to analyze Market Street, define its problems, and suggest an approach to revitalization. The resulting study proposed a program of redevelopment that featured improvements to Market Street signage, street furniture, tree plantings, site features like fountains and sculptures, and arrangement of squares and plazas. Not long after, the city and county of San Francisco commissioned the Market Street Joint Venture Architects, consisting of architects Mario Ciampi and John Carl Warnicke, as well as Halperin, to build upon this new concept for San Francisco's Main Street. The team sought to reinforce Market Street's economic and cultural importance as San Francisco's main circulation spine by introducing plazas, removing visually cluttering commercial signage, and adding sidewalk landscape designs that blended new street-level BART facilities into the overall streetscape. The Market Street Redevelopment Plan was built between 1968 and 1979 and aimed to provide an alternative to the destructive and divisive approaches to urban redevelopment that preceded it. The pedestrian-oriented design philosophy and sensitivity to historic settings reflected the specializations of the designers who sought to prioritize the human experience and awareness of the existing built environment. These are considerations that have grown to be widely adopted as best practices within the urban planning and landscape design professions. Paradoxically, construction of BART and the new Market Street streetscape lasted years and disrupted downtown commerce, and not all agree that the project has met its lofty goals. One way in which the architects prioritized the pedestrian experience was by placing small and large plazas across the length of Market Street. These pedestrian plazas offer room-like open spaces that encourage pause for pedestrians. The first plaza on our tour is Embarcadero Plaza, originally known as Justin Herman Plaza. The plaza was implemented as part of the city of San Francisco's broader effort to redevelop the Embarcadero area, and the location and timing of the project allowed it to be included as a component of the design concept for the Market Street redevelopment plan. Lawrence Halperin, who had national recognition by this time, was hired as the plaza's landscape architect. The plaza was reminiscent of an Italian piazza intended for users to participate in both planned activities such as concerts and passive activities such as eating lunch. Located in a mixed hotel, luxury apartment, and office district, it attracted workers, tourists, and local families. So the focal point of Embarcadero Plaza, of course, is the fountain behind me, which was designed by Quebecois artist Armand Valiancourt. Uh, the fountain reflects an important component of the original physical context of this plaza, which was the fact that in the 60s and 70s, there was a raised freeway that ran along the Embarcadero behind it. Um, so that freeway really created a boundary between this end of Market Street and the waterfront and the ferry building behind it. So Embarcadero Plaza didn't function as a, as a thoroughfare between the two. Instead, it was really a place where people would, that terminated Market Street. Um, and was nestled against this, this wall of the freeway. Um, Halpern was really thinking at that time very closely about the influence of freeways in urban settings. He recognized that they were disruptive, but he also saw them as the sources of uh, you know, potential creative expression. So this is what this fountain does. It kind of reflects the materiality and visual sense of the freeway, but also creates um, an interactive experience for users of the plaza, and it also mediates between the, the human scale of the plaza and the unhuman scale of the, of the freeway. When the Market Street redevelopment plan was implemented in the 1960s and 1970s, Market Street was actually over 120 years old at that point. Uh, its very distinctive diagonal orientation was the vision of the general surveyor of Alta California, whose name was Jasper O'Farrell. Uh, O'Farrell came up with the idea uh, in 1847. Uh, with the concept that Market Street was going to become the Grand Boulevard 
of uh, San Francisco, which at that point was a very small settlement, um, just an outpost uh, in the United States. However, after Market Street was uh, constructed in the 1840s, uh, it very quickly spurred a great deal of real estate investment um, as a number of buildings were constructed right alongside of it. Uh, at first, they were you know, wood framed, uh, but then over the decades, they were replaced by larger, more ornate uh, masonry buildings. Uh, at the same time, uh, Market Street became the primary transportation corridor of San Francisco. Um, by the 18, 1860s, it hosted various forms of transit, including steam-powered railroads, uh, horse-drawn streetcars, and cable cars. Um, a lot of these aspects are still uh, visible in Market Street. So obviously, we still have the street walls that really show its uh, primary uh, importance in downtown San Francisco. Of course, the street walls are now mostly uh, post-World War II uh, high-rise office towers. Um, but multiple transportation modes exist as well, including muni buses and the historic F-Line, which runs on rail tracks uh, down the middle of the street. And then, of course, BART runs underneath. Um, the one thing that has kind of changed about Market Street uh, in the post-war period was the greater emphasis on pedestrians. And one of the changes that the Market Street Redevelopment Plan introduced was uh, widening these uh, pedestrian zones, this, the sidewalks, to 35 feet. Um, and those, of course, again, are defined by the red brick pavers that run the stretch of Market Street. So we're now in Robert Frost Plaza, which is one of the small plazas along Market Street. Uh, it's at Drum Street, which is just one block west of Embarcadero Plaza. Uh, the placement of the small plazas and the large plazas along Market Street reflects one of the important design concepts of the Market Street Redevelopment Plan, which was having a, a cadence or rhythm of areas uh, where pedestrians can stop, mingle, rest, um, providing a variety of experiences as they move across the Market Street corridor. The plaza is named for the San Francisco-born poet Robert Frost, who is commemorated with a memorial plaque located at the center of the plaza. Other original features that remain include the herringbone red brick pattern that matches the rest of Market Street and a bronze four-sided clock mounted upon a granite pillar. A wood slat bench and light pole with a square translucent glass light were components of the original design, but have since been removed. So we are now across Drum Street from Robert Frost Plaza, uh, and this spot gives us a good vantage point towards the Hyatt Regency Hotel uh, and one of the office towers of the Embarcadero Center behind it. Um, both of these buildings are components of the much larger Golden Gateway redevelopment area, which was planned and constructed by the San Francisco Redevelopment Agency in the, in the 1960s and 1970s, uh, which really shows the important social and cultural context of redevelopment in San Francisco. So I'm now standing at the corner of Market Street and Battery Street uh, at, Mechan at Mechanics Monument Plaza. Uh, the focal point of the plaza is Mechanics Monument, which is one of the uh, several monuments and sculptures that the Market Street Joint Ventures architects uh, retained in the Market Street Redevelopment Plan design. This cast bronze sculpture of workers positioned around an oversized lever punch machine weighs 10 tons. At the base of the machine are an anvil, a wheel, and two overlapping medallion portraits of Peter and James Donahue with a Latin inscription that translates to Work Conquers All. It dates to 1901 and was originally a collaboration between sculptor Douglas Tilden, who designed the, uh, the, the bronze sculpture at the top of the monument, and renowned Beaux-Arts architect Willis Polk, who designed the base of the monument. Uh, it honors San Francisco industrialist Peter Donahue, who founded the Union Iron Works in 1850. The Market Street Redevelopment Plan relocated the monument a short distance from its original location. Again in 2014, the plaza was redesigned to incorporate additional street furniture and new paving. The monument speaks to San Francisco labor history, to which Market Street also has a close association. By the turn of the 20th century, Market Street had become the principal site of most public processions and parades in San Francisco. Labor Day parades typically traveled up Market Street to the Mechanics Pavilion at 10th Street, but often slowed around the Chronicle building at Kearney Street to protest the staunchly anti-union San Francisco Chronicle. Another historic feature is the admission, is the admission day monument, which is at the foot of Montgomery Street. 
The monument memorializes California's admission into the Union in 1850. Like the Mechanics Monument, the sculpture was designed by Douglas Tilden, and Willis Polk designed the pedestal. The project also involved architect Daniel Burnham, known as the father of the City Beautiful movement. The monument was commissioned in 1897 by former San Francisco Mayor James Phelan, who dedicated this to the Native Sons of the Golden West, or the Native Sons. Uh, that was the San Francisco organization whose headquarters was just a few blocks away from here. Uh, their goal was to commemorate the gold rush history of the state, uh, but they were also well known for their staunchly anti-immigration stance. So the formal beauty of this monument really belies the ideals behind that organization. Our next stop is Crocker Plaza, which is located at the intersection of Market Street, Montgomery Street, and Post Street. Crocker Plaza is named for its association with uh, now controversial railroad pioneer Charles Crocker, whose estate purchased this entire site uh, in the 19th century and built the Crocker Building, which stood here until the, the 1960s. At that point, the Crocker Building was torn down to make way for the Edna Life and Casualty Building, now known as One Post. Uh, Crocker Plaza was designed uh, in collaboration with the Market Street Redevelopment Plan, but its landscape architect was Sasaki Walker and Associates, so not Lawrence Halperin. However, uh, it was designed to match the pavement pattern of the Market Street Redevelopment Plan um, and is meant to replicate and contribute to the pattern of uh, repeating uh, plazas along Market Street. So Crocker Plaza, which is now known as One Post Plaza, has a primary street level plaza and then a sunken plaza that hosts uh, some commercial retail spaces as well as an entrance to the subsurface BART system. Located in a traffic island at the intersection of Market, Geary, and Kearney Streets is Lotus Fountain, um, it stands 24 feet tall and is constructed of cast iron. Uh, it features a series of lion heads uh, and several basins for the fountain. Um, it is unusual for a fountain in the fact that it has a glass globe at the top. The fountain is named for Charlotte Crabtree, or Miss Lotta, one of the most famous entertainers of her era. Lotta began her career singing in mining camps, eventually moving to San Francisco in 1856, where she began performing in major theaters and vaudeville houses. To take her career to new heights, Lotta eventually moved to New York and later Chicago, performing all over the country. She was possibly the highest paid female entertainer of her era. Her last trip to San Francisco was in 1915 for Lotta Crabtree Day at the Panama Pacific International Exposition. Uh, the earthquake that hit San Francisco in April 1906 was a very transformative moment for the city. Over 28,000 buildings across the city were destroyed, including the majority of those that were along Market Street. Once debris had been removed, a wide array of infrastructure had to be reconstructed across San Francisco, including the cable car system and the city's streets. New infrastructure was also added, including the fire department's auxiliary water supply system, or AWSS. In 1913, the initial phase of the AWSS was completed and featured pumping facilities, distribution pipes, in a series of high-pressure hydrants located throughout the core of the city. Here is one hydrant of, long, of that system, and about 60 are alongside the Market Street corridor. So some of the most prominent historic features retained in the Market Street redevelopment plan design are the Path of Gold light standards. Uh, these were built, uh, installed between 1906 and 1916, generally in pairs along Market Street between the Embarcadero and Valencia Street. Uh, the Path of Gold name refers to the soft glow uh, light that comes through the golden glass globes. Um, the design features a base uh, designed by sculptor Ar Arthur Putnam, uh, a pole assembly designed by Willis Polk, and then the trident tops which were installed later. Uh, those were designed by a separate sculptor Leo Lentelli uh, and the lighting engineer Walter Darcy Ryan. The design of Putnam's sculpted base, called Winning of the West, offers a problematic narrative of Western expansion that often went unchallenged during the early 20th century. One of the more memorable street features along Market Street is Samuel's Clock, which stands 18 feet tall. Uh, it's located between uh, Powell Street and Stockton Street on the north side of Market Street, and it dates to 1915. 
Uh, it was commissioned by the Austrian immigrant and watchmaker Albert Samuels. Uh, he first installed it outside of his business uh, at 895 Market Street and moved it to its, its current location in the 1940s. Um, and the Market Street redevelopment plan retained this feature and uh, as the, the clock itself says, it is one of the, the finest street clocks in, the, in America. We're now at Halliday Plaza, which is the second of the large plazas along Market Street. Uh, we're at the corner of uh, Powell Street and Market Street, near Fifth Street. Um, and this reflects one of the realities of working along the Market Street corridor, which is the series of oddly shaped triangular lots uh, that are adjacent to, to Market Street. Uh, this required that, they, that the Market Street the redevelopment plan design team think about the streets that intersect here. Um, Eddy Street to my left and then uh, Powell Street in, in front of me were closed to traffic um, and made into pedestrian malls that form part of this plaza. Um, another advantage of working in a site like this is the intersecting streets uh, provide channels for sunlight um, that can really cast light on the Market Street corridor that otherwise wouldn't be able to when buildings were previously here. So like other plazas along Market Street, Howdy Plaza functions as a transit hub and a connection to the subsurface BART and MINI systems. However, it's, I would say, a more important role at this particular plaza. Uh, as you can see behind me, there's a large entrance to the Powell Street, BART, and MUNI station. Um, so the plaza functions as uh, a route for people to leave transit and enter the Union Square retail district and also allows them to exit the neighborhood and, and board transit. Um, the idea of having a multi-tiered sunken plaza was Halperin's. He wanted to offer a, a change from the monotony, single plane experience of Market Street. So both have, it has functional characteristics, but also the, uh, the design concept of the stepped terraces along the edges of, of Halliday Plaza could also facilitate um, you know, just gathering and viewing as if an, amp an amphitheater for events. So we're now in the largest plaza along Market Street, which is UN Plaza, or United Nations Plaza. Uh, it was dedicated in 1976 to commemorate the founding of the United Nations in 1945. This two and a half acre plaza serves as a tree-lined approach to the Civic Center, as well as an open space for the mid-market area. The design landscape features a set of linear axes with a commanding fountain near Market Street. Lawrence Halpern was the primary designer of UN Plaza. He designed this plaza, as with his other public plazas, for the diversity of events and users found in cities. Both the plaza and fountain were designed to direct views towards City Hall. UN Plaza was the pivot point off Market Street and offered a path for parades to march along toward the steps of City Hall. Halpern directed views towards City Hall through the linear spatial arrangement emphasized by several elements, which include London plane trees, raised planting beds, and the dominant rows of light standards along the Fulton Street Promenade. Like an Embarcadero Plaza, UN Plaza has a prominent fountain that Halpern incorporated into his design. Uh, this particular fountain is uh, com composed of, an, of a series of large granite slabs. Each one weighs about three to four tons uh, and the, are set into groups that symbolize the world's continents. The water symbolizes the world's oceans uh, and originally had a uh, kind of filling and emptying mechanism that, that represented the tidal cycles. However, now the arced jets are all that are operational. Halpern's vision for UN Plaza included it being a site of social gatherings, parades, and protests. Uh, this has definitely been supported by the fact that it links Market Street with City Hall, so many parades that uh, follow Market Street leave Market Street at this point and then proceed into Civic Center. Uh, in 1985, a group of activists chose this area of UN Plaza in front of the federal building as the site of a peaceful demonstration against the federal government and its inaction uh, against the AIDS epidemic. Uh, their vigil lasted for 10 years and is among the longest running uh, acts of civil disobedience in San Francisco history. In a similar spirit, Marcus Street has served as a backdrop for public interaction and social protest since its earliest days. This pattern was particularly strong around the themes of labor, civil rights, and peace during the 1960s and 70s. Some events have included protests against military interventions, marches for African-American civil rights, and a disability rights sit-in. One of the most significant civic engagement events on Market Street during the 20th century was the launch of the San Francisco LGBTQ Pride Celebration and Parade. While the first gay rights parade took place in 1970 on Polk Street, 
Beginning in 1977, the Gay Freedom Day parades traveled west across Market Street from downtown to City Hall. The parades of 1977 and 1978 drew hundreds of thousands of people, making it the biggest annual parade in San Francisco. The San Francisco Chronicle reported that the 1978 parade may have been the largest single political gathering in San Francisco and possibly the country in the 1970s. For that same parade, a group of artists created a rainbow flag based on a design by artist Gilbert Baker, which flew for the first time in UN Plaza. In subsequent years, the rainbow flag has come to be recognized internationally as a symbol for LGBTQ pride. So we've now reached Market Street's intersection with Van Ness Avenue, a major north-south uh, corridor that really forms the western boundary of downtown San Francisco and the Civic Center District. Uh, so from the west here, Market Street really enters more of a mixed residential and commercial na neighborhood um, that goes through that goes adjacent to neighborhoods like Hayes Valley and the northern end of the Castro. However, uh, the transit entrances still continue. Uh, this particular station is the Van Ness Avenue station that serves just the uh, Muni streetcar system. Um, like all of the transit entrances along Market Street, though this is just has a simple lobe wall uh, that matches the overall minimalist architectural character of the streetscape. For the last step of our tour, we have reached Octavia Boulevard, which is the western end of the Market Street redevelopment plan design. So this is the last area that we have the red brick paving that we've seen throughout the tour. Uh, to the west of here, Market Street just transitions to, to simple concrete sidewalks. Uh, Octavia Boulevard was the natural endpoint for the design in the 1960s and 70s because Octavia Boulevard was actually the location of a raised freeway that was demolished in the, after the 1989 earthquake. Aerial images show the contrasting red brick and pavement that makes up the sidewalks southwest of Market Street. The three designers associated with the Market Street redevelopment plan in San Francisco, Giampi, Warnicke, and Halprin, developed their expertise as master designers during a period of great urban change and development practice, often referred to as urban renewal, that correspond with the years after World War II. This period is also associated with increased collaboration among design disciplines. These designers were thought leaders in the environmental design community, applying new approaches to urban placemaking that modeled pedestrian-oriented design, harmonizing postmodern design within historic settings, developing public spaces for positive economic and social impact and collaborative design processes. The joint venture of these masters was an early application of an interdisciplinary approach to design, bringing together masters in the fields of architecture and landscape architecture. Their effort helped elevate landscape architecture as a discipline that provides essential perspective on modern urban planning. The project illustrates the growing viability in the post-war period of prioritizing sensitivity to the human experience and the existing built environment as a part of the urban redevelopment process. For nearly five decades, Market Street has reflected the innovative ideas of its design team, but its importance is easily overlooked as San Francisco's and visitors conduct their everyday routines. The fact that the design of Market Street is so taken for granted speaks to its silent but important role shaping the experiences of so many who pass through downtown San Francisco. So I think that is the end there. And so we will rejoin now. Um, so you all just saw and heard a lot of, from me. So now this is the chance for our other esteemed panelists to uh, get the chance to share their thoughts. Um, but I will start by saying that after thinking a lot about the history of Market Street that we highlighted in the video, one of the things that has really stuck with me is that yes, Market Street's character is as a large scale and designed cultural landscape, um, and designers like Halperin, Ciampi, and Warnicke, of course, contributed their great expertise to remaking Market Street in the second half of the 20th century. But it's also a site whose essential purpose is to allow individuals to create and really design it as a place for themselves. So I want to e ask each of our panelists if they can describe how they came to understand and experience Market Street as individuals. Um, starting with Woody, I know that you grew up in San Francisco. Can you describe your earliest experiences with Market Street and your understanding of its importance in the city where you were raised? 
Sure. I mean, for us, and I think even more so for the generation or two above me, um, I was a kid in the early 70s, um, a trip to Market Street, and Market Street is what made San Francisco feel like a city to us. You know, San Francisco is so much a city of neighborhoods that can feel like their own little hamlets. But Market Street was downtown and what joined everybody together. It, a trip to shop at the Emporium um, meant actually getting dressed up. Um, even in the early 70s, uh, my grandmother's attire for the journey down uh, to the, from the Richmond district on the 21 Hayes bus meant she dressed up just a little below church going attire. So it was like um, we were to, you know, to be presentable, to represent ourselves proudly because in a way Market Street's always been the city's stage. You know, we have our costumes that we represent ourselves as San Franciscans on Market Street. And the city has always put a lot of attention as you showed in the video to the design of this stage um, from the Path of Gold light poles to the plazas, the modernist plazas. And, and I think in the other way, when I, when I was a kid or growing up, Market Street was always a pass through area as well. It's, a, it's kind of a river of people and vehicles more than a stationary place. It's, uh, I think even the entry of the cross streets on the diagonal give it that river feeling rather than some part of a set grid. And it's just a great transit tumult and it always has been of different kinds of vehicles and nowadays many, many bicyclists. Um, and I think lastly, I think as a kid and as growing up and going to parades and protests and marches that Market Street has always been um, the arterial, I guess, where all of San Franciscans come together. Um, so it can be a dividing line. It always was traditionally and historically a dividing line between sort of the money and the fashionable classes on the north side and the laboring classes south of Market. But it's, it's that dividing line where people come together for parades, pride parades, Super Bowl parties, um, civil rights marches. It's, it's essentially San Francisco's front porch and its main stage. And I think that's how most San Franciscans feel about it um, in the past and today. Thank you. And I, I love that metaphor as a river. I never thought about that, but it seems totally apt given the tributaries that are coming into it. Um, Gretchen and Hannah, on the other hand, I think that you both encounter Market Street when you already had familiarity with mid-century design concepts and, and also Lawrence Halpern's work. So did you view it or experience it as a significant land, a design landscape when you moved to San Francisco? I can start, Anna. I, it's so funny because my, my experience is opposite of Woody's. I grew up on the East Coast. And so I first became aware of Market Street because I was studying Lawrence Halperin in grad school. And I was reading his book, Cities, where, which he features. Market Street is one of the projects. So I very much came to it from a very academic kind of lofty pursuit of researching Lawrence Halperin's work. And so when I moved to San Francisco, I very quickly became oriented to Market Street because I didn't have a car. And so I took BART everywhere to get to work, downtown, to go shopping, to do whatever I needed to do. And so I was experiencing Market Street in these little snippets, I think, you know, from the BART station to wherever I was going, north and south. Um, but it was very much a part of my daily commute, part of my daily kind of experience of the city. And I think only recently, like in the last five years or so, when I, I, I went to like a march, uh, a Black Lives Matter march on Market Street, where they had closed down the street. And it was the first time I think I'd ever walked the entire street from start to finish and really had this more, uh, more awesome perspective of standing in the middle of the street and really understanding and experiencing that backdrop of buildings and sort of the sequence as it moves through its different sections of the city. Um, so it was kind of a cool experience to do that. But yeah, definitely learned about it more from the academic realm. I think that I had some kind of like hybrid experience uh, somewhere between Woody and Gretchen's. I actually grew up in the Bay Area as well, but um, for most of that time I was living in the East Bay and, you know, we would take BART or drive across the Bay Bridge to like come visit my dad who was working at Transamerica Pyramid or whatever. Um, so I think that Market Street didn't register in the same way to me probably as a child. And then later in life, I think that moving back to San Francisco, I still wasn't quite in the world of architectural history 
yet in my primary experience uh, with Market Street was like trying to drive a sprinter van with a espresso machine in the back uh, when I was working in coffee and hitting a lot of traffic across Market Street, which I think is a typical experience. But um, I kind of, I liked how Woody was uh, touching on this idea of the tributaries and John in your video, you mentioned that it's this intersection of two different grid systems um, in the city. And I think that there's probably some kind of extended metaphor that we could make about, you know, the greatest laid plans, you know, both of these grids were like nicely laid out on their own and then come together at Market Street and create a bit of chaos when it comes to transit and like moving through and, you know, the grids don't quite align. So there's kind of um, uh, a bit of a tension between the ideals of city planning and the kind of lived reality of San Francisco that I think is embodied in a very um, intense way along Market Street. But I think that the first time that I really was like super excited about the Market Street um, streetscape was revisiting Embarcadero Plaza and um, starting to learn about the kind of different histories that that plaza has had and um, kind of realizing how deeply embedded that plaza is in popular culture. It shows up in the movie Bullet. It shows up in like Tony Hawk Pro Skater. It's like this very strange um, space that's had like very kind of been a touchstone for a lot of different groups of people. And learning about that and learning, you know, how different people have found ways to use that space and reimagine it um, was really exciting for me and kind of one of my entries like into thinking about Halperin and his kind of approach to space, so. Great, thank you. Um, back to Woody. So you were discussing the symbolic importance of Market Street to San Franciscans. Um, so do you think it was important for residents of the city to have a you know, modern looking downtown thoroughfare or do you think it was possibly seen as just kind of a component of the inevitable change that accompanied BART construction? Um, it's hard to parse out, especially historically, what's important to residents and what's important to people who are influential and powerful. <laughs> so I would say uh, that, but I can't say that the fretting over the state of Market Street and how to improve it has always been with us as San Franciscans and likely always will um, because it plays such an important role representing San Francisco to the world. Basically, like you said, John, everybody who comes to San Francisco, tourist, executive, investor, any diplomat, they're going to be on Market Street at some point. Um, but it's also the spine of the city's transportation network, you know, public transportation especially. So it, its design has always had to kind of accommodate aesthetic and practical needs. And I do feel like, like many urban centers in the late 60s and early 70s, San Francisco was feeling very beaten down um, and kind of like, we need a reset. They didn't say that then, but that's what we would say now. And um, so I think there was a lot of great optimism and that big plans and a modern design would revitalize and refresh Market Street and give the city a boost. And the creation of BART, which was many years in the making, just provided that opportunity to take a big swing, you know? And I think what's kind of ironic is we're at the CPF webinar and, you know, it's like these large scale redevelopment projects often have losses to historic resources, but here we are talking about and celebrating um, something that replaced some of the things we lost at that during redevelopment times. So, so I guess I would say is it's, it wasn't uh, necessarily had to happen, but it, it definitely fit in with what was wanted at the time in San Francisco. Yeah, I mean, it definitely introduced a totally new way of thinking about design practices. And so um, Gretchen, I was curious if you can describe in a bit more detail um, how Halpern worked in his design process and how that relates to the type of urban activities that he and his partner designers wanted to foster along Market Street? Yeah, sure. I think a lot of people are familiar with his process that he used for designing Sea Ranch. He had this kind of series of workshops with students from Berkeley that he was teaching and he would bring people to a site and do what he called these choreographed 
scores like you would in music where you're like going through and you're experiencing and it, it was very of its time you know 60s and 70s and you know people were sketching and making observations of their sensory experiences through the street their movements kind of like dance choreography and he did the same thing for market street so Market Street was one of the other major projects that he imply, employed those workshop techniques. There was a really great exhibit at California Historical Society, like maybe five or so years ago, all about this workshop concept. And so it was all about getting people out and talking about how they would use the street and experiencing it kind of as part of that early design development, and then using the information um, kind of gleaned from those workshops as a pretty major part of how they then decided what to move forward with in, de in the design. So it was very much this participatory design process. It was pretty cutting edge at the time. I know now today we talk about participatory design all the time, but back then it was a pretty new um, idea to include, you know, potential users of the space in the design process early on. Yeah, I remember at that exhibit there was a there was an event where I think that there was a like a, he was either a lawyer or a construction worker who taught, who was able to, sh to share his experiences working in Halperin's process um, and how it like profoundly changed his life. And it was really, really powerful to see how he was connecting with all these people who yeah. maybe weren't, you know, typically part of the design process. Yeah, and um, I saw Pet Petra just uh, posted a comment in the chat. So Lawrence Halperin's wife, Anna Halperin, was an incredibly famous dancer. And so it also was very much part of sort of their collaboration as a couple and the concepts that she bring to his work by influence. So dance, you know, and movement is not something a landscape architect often talks about, but I think because of their relationship, that was another really big reason of why he was going down that path in his design work. Yeah. So um, I have one follow-up question, and I think after that, um, we'll open it up to the audience. But um, as a related question, so choreography is clearly a critical concept um, to the market street design and function. Um, and so, you know, as I think everybody has kind of discussed, the key quality of market street has been its ability to act as a stage for social and civic life in San Francisco. Um, so for all three of you, in what ways do you think that market street does that most successfully? And if, and um, are these the ways that it was maybe intended to, to function by the designers in the 60s and 70s? Well, I do think that the plazas and the pedestrian, the increased pedestrian space was the great um, sort of uh, highlight of the work that the modernists did. And it comes out during these victory parades, during these marches, during Pride Parade, during the Chinese New Year's Parade. These spaces where people can gather and where people can sort of assemble and spread out and contract. Um, to me, that's the most successful part of the pedestrian friendliness and the width of it um, has been the most successful part of the Market Street uh, plan, yeah. Yeah, and I would totally agree. Actually, I think it's interesting because uh, just thinking about the entire history of Market Street, I know we're talking a lot about the modern design right now, but you know, it was originally designed as this grand boulevard and that's why the street is so wide. That was back from the original O'Farrell plan that that was established. And so I love how over time we have these like little threads of its history that get carried through to the new design. And so like the original frame of Market Street and its width was established back in the 1800s. You know, it definitely was completely redesigned in the seventies with the MSRP design, but now we're doing that again with better Market Street plan. And I think it's interesting that for the better Market Street plan, the things that are going to remain are the plazas, which is really, I'm, I'm really happy to see that. I think they are the most successful parts of that original design. I know they have their own controversy and their own issues in terms of the maintenance and management of those spaces, but um, I do like that the plazas are sort of this thread that's being pulled through to the next chapter. Yeah, I feel like not to just uh, agree with everyone, but I think the plazas are really the most, you know, successful, engaged part of the Market Street space. And I think part of it is the recognition that Halperin and the other designers had that these plazas could be fairly unprogrammed and then in that sense are able to be like filled with all of these uses, um, 
that maybe aren't anticipated, even though there was this, you know, very participatory design process. I think there's a recognition that the city needs kind of unprogrammed public spaces that can fulfill changing needs over time. And, you know, they might not have anticipated the specific social protests that had happened at all of these plazas um, or kind of other things that happened throughout history, you know, at these places like Occupy Wall Street and all of these things have happened in these spaces that couldn't have been anticipated, but have been really important to the history of the city and Market Street. So I think that that's part of, part of their success. All right, well, we, thanks to you all. We will move over to the, the um, audience Q&As and John Haber. Um, I'm looking at them now and I'm, is there an order that we take them in? Uh, yeah, uh, from top to bottom, if you sort it by upvotes, that's probably the preference here. Um, and just a reminder to everybody, uh, please keep asking your questions. We have uh, 13 minutes here. Um, I'll mention one thing about Lotus Fountain while John, uh, John is reading through the questions. Um, one piece of trivia I loved was that during the progressive era, there were plans by the city to build a subterranean restroom right below the fountain so that uh, people could walk down into the bells under the fountain and use the restroom and then emerge back above uh, the water. So it kind of gives you a sense of the changing ideals and needs of people over time. Um, but there's a lot, there were a lot of comments about some of the landmarks you visited, John, and uh, maybe you have, uh, maybe the first question about the bricks would be a good one. You want to read that one or? Yeah, that was the one I was going to start with. So this comes from Petra. Hey, Petra. Um, she asks, I'm curious to hear more about the choice of brick in the, in the um, MMRP design. Was it a common choice for modernists at the time? Um, I think a modernism design, modernist design is a break from previous eras and also as brick is an older material. Uh, curious if you've come across why brick was used and if other materials were considered. Anybody on the panel have some insights on that? <laughs> I can speak to that a little bit. I think um, it is unusual, I think, to have such a large use of brick in as a paving material. We do see some other kind of unique custom paving materials at Embarcadero, like in the Golden Gateway at the Embarcadero Center. They have those, I don't know if it's granite or some other type of stone um, paving patterns in those circles. And I think it was either Lawrence Halpern or Sasaki Walker that designed that as part of Embarcadero Center. I can't, I can't remember off the top of my head, but it's a similar thing where they introduced this kind of unconventional stone paving that actually is a huge slip hazard when it rains. I think that's the biggest critique of that material. Um, but the herringbone, you know, was, I mean, I went to UVA, so I think of the herringbone at Thomas Jefferson's um, lawn at UVA was kind of a clear historic precedent for that. And I don't know the exact reasons why they chose to use that material, but it was kind of a, a very conscious choice and a very unusual choice, I think, for its time. Yeah, one thing I would say about that is I think that um, Halpern was using brick in other San Francisco projects around this time, so maybe it was just on his mind a little bit. The redevelopment or the adaptive reuse of Ghirardelli Square is also around this early 60s period, and obviously that's a site that has a lot of brick, um, and I think that you know, for that, in that case, it, there was maybe a connection to the kind of more industrial past, but I think it is somewhat forgotten that brick is often seen in a lot of brutalist um, and like 60s era architecture. Um, I think someone mentioned Boston City Hall, that also has a, a brick plaza, um, and brick was used by a lot of other modernist architects like Lou Kahn is, you know, kind of famous for using it in his project. So it is interesting that it is such an old um, material, but I think that a lot of modernists were finding new ways to use it um, within this kind of new uh, design language. I love in the chat, people are giving examples in the chat too, which is great. <laughs> There's a lot of it. I will add that, I mean, some, one of the themes that's in the video um, is that the better market, or I'm sorry, the MMRP um, design really did balance kind of a new aesthetic with existing 
elements in the streetscape and we looked at some of the memorials and things like the path of gold. Um, but I think that this kind of shows, I mean, having like that herringbone pattern is, I don't know that I've seen it, it particularly in, in another setting in a modernist context, um, but it definitely harkens back to kind of like an older um, texture. Um, but, you know, this is like kind of a different era of that. Some of the preservation minded elements of the MMRP, you know, like they were interesting design um, interventions, but definitely kind of a, from a, a period that was not in our current preservation moment. I, I was just reminded preparing for this that um, there was a proposal supported, I think, by Ciampi and Halpern to demolish at least one wing of the ferry building as part of the, the redevelopment of the waterfront and a ferry plaza. Um, so, you know, the, they kind of had an attitude, I think, of like, take what we want. Maybe we won't get too um, upset if we uh, destroy some historic fabric. So I think that kind of the, the, the brick seems to represent kind of that balance that um, we call it balance or that approach that they're taking. Um, yeah, and it seems also to be uh, what, you know, I guess they could have used a different material to accomplish this, but the brick, it, it has like a very warm tone and also the fact that it's not a paving material that's used typically on other streets throughout the city, it does like lend a sense of cohesiveness and you kind of, if you're, you know, paying attention to the ground below you, you kind of like feel that you've arrived in Market Street and you're kind of like maybe aware that this is, uh, you know, a designed, cohesive designed landscape as opposed to the kind of more typical concrete sidewalks throughout the rest of the city. Okay, I'm gonna to move to the next question. Um, that it's actually, there is a question that's related to the brick. So I, where did that go? Um, oh, I'm having a hard time navigating. It's just here. Oh, there's a question. Um, so do, do you think it, at all mistakes were made such as the red brick papers? that collect grime and can be slippery um, and the sunken plazas at Powell and Montgomery streets that are not well used. So I guess this question is about the reappraisal of Market Street at the current moment. Pretty open-ended question, but um, anybody wanna take a, take a stab at that one? I think the sunken plazas are the most thorny aspect of it all. I mean, I, I do know there's people who have issues with the slipperiness of the brick for sure. Um, and I'm not downplaying that, but I do think the sunken plazas you know, Hannah talked about sort of not knowing what these plazas would be used for and how great that was in some ways. I got to see Bono of U2, like, uh, you know, put graffiti on the Valancourt Fountain. That was pretty cool. But um, <laughs> the sunken plazas, you know, they, they are hard to regulate. Let's put it that way. Um, you just don't know what's going to happen down there. They're hard to keep clean. Um, and I do think that they've created... Um, more trouble for the city than almost any other part of the plan. Um, and they will continue to. I, I do feel like uh, design, this is another example where design looks great. You look at this and you change the elevation, you bring you down, it's like a very humanizing and gradual way to get down to the BART station. Um, I think the fountains are another bit of a problematic issue, um, but I do think the sunken plazas did not age well pretty quickly, so. Yeah, and I think like in talking about the fountains too, which I know there were some questions about, it's interesting because like Lawrence Halpern specifically, his fountains are very successful in other places, but they're not successful in San Francisco. And it's complicated, I think, as to why. But like, if you look at the Portland sequence up in Portland, the it's near the university, those are still the most, one of the most celebrated features in Portland. People swim in them, you know, in the summer. And it's, it's crazy because they're, dangerous. They're like these big blocks of stone that if you fell, you could easily break your leg. And, but yet they're a celebrated kind of local community asset. Whereas I think for Market Street's fountains in particular, where specifically they are located within the street is not great. Like, uh, especially UN Plaza fountain, you know, so we were doing research and someone mentioned to us, someone like that I was interviewing in the community said, yeah, if you want to sell, if you want to sell any stolen goods, you go to UN Plaza. Everybody knows that everyone's always known that. And so it's just become this interesting magnet of 
you know, not the types of activities that you want to take your kids to go see. And um, I always feel like fountains and clocks <laughs> going to break the problem. You know, the public clocks never work, right? <laughs> they always put a public yeah. clock that never works. And the fountain, at least in San Francisco, you know, it, it has maintenance issues almost all the time. Something gets clogged in it. And, uh, and yeah, they're just not successful here for some reason. So, plus, I don't know about climate change, but I do wonder about maybe you guys, when you did the study, know a little bit more about the recycling of water or how, how they're actually um, used, but they're problematic. Yeah. They're beautiful. I do think they're beautiful though. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love My those fountains. Don't get me wrong, <laughs> but they have not been uh, successful. I would say in a lot of ways. And I do want to comment on the, the plazas and specifically how the plaza, which has faced criticism since it was built as being kind of an underutilized, mm -hmm. just, you know, go down. It's like a, the hole that you go down into BART, um, and it hasn't really worked out at so much as a place for gathering and activity, even though it's really kind of set up as an amphitheater. Um, but when I was, when we were filming, I mean, there were, there were, there were staff members, and I really apologize because I don't remember what organization they were from, but they were, you know, pretty well represented in Healthy Plaza and were actively trying to engage with people to program the space. I think that in the video we saw, um, you know, this beanbag toss that was in, in the concourse in Healthy Plaza, but that was, a, you know, specifically a, um, an activity that, that they were sponsoring. So there is kind of this element of like needing to, to program and really keep, you know, you, it's not easy to program a space and then just walk away and think that it's going to run the way that you think it's going to, that it really needs constant, constant maintenance and upkeep and, um, you know, attention to keep it going. There so, also was originally know a lot of street furnishings that have been removed like there were benches and a lot a lot more I think intentional creation of space for people and more individual people to spend time that have been removed for a variety of you know safety maintenance reasons and so I think that also contributes to sort of why it doesn't work because there's there's nowhere to sit there's nowhere to kind of have any sort of group congregation except for Embarcadero Plaza which is more of like standing large-scale gathering it's just some of that human element has been removed without the street furnishings. And I think one thing I would like add to this conversation is just, you know, thinking about how you define success in terms of urban um, projects. You know, I think that there obviously was a user or a user class in mind when these were designed. And I think you know, there's an idealized way that we think urban space should be used, and that doesn't always match with the reality of kind of our social and economic conditions. And, you know, is, you know, is that a failure of design or is that a failure of um, other aspects of our society? Um, and also, you know, I think that there's examples like Embarcadero Plaza, I kind of touched on this, but it, you know, in the 90s, it became this like very iconic skate skateboarding site um and i think that you know that was like a really huge part of skate culture and really um a, a valuable spot for these like this you know one group of constituents but you know to many other people they it was seen you know that seen as a nuisance or um, not the appropriate use for that space. Um, so I think it's just important to remember, you know, thinking, thinking about how we kind of define that question and, and define success. Well, we are now at our cutoff of 1 p.m. So I might hand it over to John Haber to wrap things up or Chris. Yeah, <laughs> here I am. Thank you so much for that uh, conversation. Uh, John, did you want to say a few things first? John Haber? Oh, uh, yes. Um, so first of all, thank you all. This was a wonderful tour. We're going to make it available on our YouTube channel if people want to watch it later. Uh, and we had a lot of questions. And if you send those questions to us, we'll be sure to forward them to the panelists in case they'd like to respond by email. So feel free to do that. Um, also, I'm going to paste into the chat box uh, some links. Um, wanted to remind everybody that our annual conference is coming up in June, from June 8th through the 12th. This year, we're doing something special called Doors Open California. Gretchen is involved in the planning, I know. So um, or for the conference programs, we also are having from uh, June 8th through 10th, I think, 7th through 10th, Chris. 
Please refresh my memory. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's all on the website, CaliforniaPreservation.org, John, and we um, can all find it there. Yeah, and uh, finally, just wanted to turn it over to Chris if you have any final words, but thank you all for your time today. Yes, of course. I would also like to thank all of the speakers for bringing your expertise to our audience and definitely check out our website, CaliforniaPreservation.org, where you can join or look at all the details of our upcoming conference. And if you're interested, uh, you can sponsor, and I posted in our pre-roll that all the sponsors are getting a gift courtesy of Fat Gold Olive Oil, a woman-owned olive oil company in California. So check out our website and we'll see you all 